Please join in the unison scripture reading from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and we brought out to the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me around, around them. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these lords, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and I commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breath and breathe upon the slain that they may live. I prophesied as I commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, but we are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am coming hope. Ho and graves, O oh, peop my people, I will bring you back to the Lord of Israel, and you shall know that I am God. <laughs> and oh, in your graves, O oh, my people, I put a spirit into you. you. You will live, and you will place you on your own soil, and you shall have that I am the Lord, have spoken, and will act, says the Lord. Hello, hello. How's everybody this morning? Teresa and Jeremiah and Jack and Owen and Sam. We just heard a story about bones being brought to, brought to life, a valley of dry bones. Um, have you, do you know the story, uh, The Lion King? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Lion King? Yeah. Lion King. Yeah, do you remember when, what's his name? You don't know? S Simba, that's right. Simba was tricked, and he went to this valley where there were these, all these elephant bones, right? And it was really scary. Huh. And who's that? Do you remember her name? Yeah, I think. No, it starts with N Nala. Nala, aren't you good? Oh, hey, hey, Teresa. Ah. I'm sorry. Um, Nala, it's Simba and Nala, and they're scared. They're absolutely scared. Yeah, because I, I saw the pool. I definitely saw. And maybe if you watched it, you were scared with them, right? No. No. Really? I got scared. I was scared with them. Anyway, somebody came, comes and saves them. Do you remember who? The Lion King comes and saves them, right? And they're, then they're really scared, and, they, um, uh, and in comes the, the dad, Simba's dad, to, to help them and save them. And there's certain things about that story that I th think are interesting. Um, the being in that valley of dry bones, it was, they chose, they chose it. It was a mistake. They chose it. Do you think Simba and Nala got in trouble? 
you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think there were consequences? Yeah, right? But they were very fortunate that their dad knew and came and saved them and brought them out and then did that don't do that again speech. Have you ever gotten that speech? Nope. You've never gotten the don't do that again speech? Really? I promise you before, someday you will get the don't do that again speech. Did we learn our lesson? I remember, oh, I remember one time I did something wrong. I, got my, 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 uh, I was waiting for the teacher to call my parent, my parent, and I thought it would be smart if I confessed before the, the, they got the phone call. And then, uh, and of course, the teacher never called. But, and then my mom said to me, and, and I was waiting to get punished, and she goes, well, I think you've learned your lesson. You won't do that again. I was like, whoa! And I learned better to fess up and, and take your chances than get caught. Hmm. <laughs> There's a lesson there, too. Anyway, yes, Owen. Why do I keep on saying what? Why is every time the screen keeps on saying? Time, time for children, because it's the time for children every week. Makes sense, right? All right. So, in the story in the Bible, Ezekiel has this vision of... Uh, where God is saying, do you see this? And everything looks desperate. Um, and all you see around you are dry bones. But guess what? New life can come. In the same way that Simba's father came and saved them, God can bring new life and hope into situations when we think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do from here? So sometimes in life, Things ha- don't turn out the way that we want them to, or we're really disappointed, or we're sad, or we think, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. God can show us that something good can come out of it, something new can happen, that, uh, that there's always hope. But we got to pray and wait for God. Okay. <laughs> Shall we pray now? Owens already. So we're going to fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Gracious God, for those times where we are disappointed and sad and just wonder where to from here, Lord, we look to you, we pray to you, and we pray that you will show us the way out of no way. And we are thankful that uh, we have our stories and that we have our stories to tell and share with the next generation that, that you do show up. And you do make a way. And we claim these promises for our kids. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have another long story from John, this time about the death and the rising of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and the of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumbled because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, 
but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may also die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home, as was the custom. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there, which was the custom. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then again, Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the womb, to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his faith, face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Back to Ezekiel, can these bones live? How does that hit you? Is there a place in your life that that speaks to? Take a deep breath and let us invite the Holy Spirit in to speak to that space. Let us pray, Holy Spirit, speak to the barren places in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do not live as those without hope, from 1 Thessalonians. But you say these bones are desiccated. There is no life there. We need to know when to walk away. But the bones were desiccated. The relief 
the release, the new life was not instantaneous. It took time. It took Jesus four days to come to Bethany. Why? Why four? Why did he wait so long? It could be that death in, in that time, it was believed that the soul, the spirit, would linger around the body for, for three days, but on, on day four, Elvis has left the building, gone, and the person is truly dead. Maybe there's a spiritual lesson to be learned. Henry Nowen has been popping up for me a left and right recently, and Henry Nowen was a wise and faithful Christian and a prolific writer, and a quote of his has come up more than once in the last few weeks, and it's, and it's, I'm paraphrasing, we should not be surprised by suffering, we should be surprised by joy. And at first glance, I hate that quote. I dislike it. Because I think we were created for joy, and I think we need to train our eyes to, to in awe and wonder and celebrate all of the, the blessings around us and to live in gratitude. But we do seem to be surprised by suffering. We rebel against the idea that it is a part of life. And, you know, and if you think about it, how could it not be because of love? If we love, then we will suffer. And once we accept that suffering is a part of life, life becomes easier. Never easy, but easier. But we can hear ourselves saying, Lord, if you had come more quickly, my brother would not have died. Both Mary and Martha say this to Jesus. Their faith in him was profound and justified. Lazarus would live again. Only to die again because death is a part of life. We remind ourselves each year at Ash Wednesday, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But we say that knowing that we're headed towards Easter. We are an Easter people, people who believe in resurrection and continue to experience resurrection in our daily lives. Joy after mourning, meaning and purpose in the face of nihilism and apathy. Direction when our lives seem to have gone off the map. New life. But it's not instantaneous. I wonder whether we would appreciate it if it were. There are times to sit in the ashes, and there are lessons for us in the ashes. It is often in the ashes that we cry out to God after we have shaken our fist at the sky or cursed God's name, rent our clothing, breathed in the ashes and convulsed our bodies with tears. New life eventually comes by the grace of God, by the breath of God. We get a second wind I know I have uh, told you the story when I was a young pastor. I was going out to a retreat, and I drove there with a pastor who was newly retired, and he was also widowed. I don't know how long, but not that long. And he said to me, and I was grateful that he did, he said, Robin, you know, I have, I know that joy will come. You know, I have preached it for years, but what I've come to realize is I don't want a new joy. I want the old joy. I know that someday I'll be ready to embrace the new life, but not yet. He needed to sit in the ashes for a while until he was ready to embrace the new life that God had in in store for him. Prophesy to the breath, Ezekiel is told. Bone and flesh appear, but life comes with the Spirit of God. In Hebrew, the word is ruach, In Greek, it's pneuma. In English, we have three words, wind, breath, or spirit. Spirit of God, come. In worship, we can can prepare all the words. We can write our, our liturgies, but if the spirit of God does not come, then it's all dust and ashes. 
I was teaching a group of uh, pastors this week who are learning about transitional ministry, and I was talking about the, the discernment process that we have been going through. And at the end of it, I said, all of this, you know, depending on your leadership, it can be like a business model or it can be spiritual discernment based on the questions that you ask folks, the reframing that you do, the reminding folks that, you are, that we are seeking God's will, not making plans for ourselves and then asking God to bless it. We are seeking God's will in this because we worship the living God. We believe that God is alive and well and has a vision for us. We just have to figure out what it is. Too many of our churches are hoping to be resurrected as they once were. <laughs> but God is doing a new thing. Or sometimes... Uh, People, churches, people pray for uh, new life, but they assume they're going to be, they're going to witness it around them and not experience it through them, that they're going to be observers when God has every intention of using us wherever we are because God is not done with us. God is never done with, with us. Imagine Lazarus, who thought his journey was done only to become a living witness to the living God. I listen to your stories and I marvel. You continue to witness to the living, to the living God. And I, and I shared with this group of pastors that one of, one of your strengths, one of your assets is that you, there are witnesses to the living God. You have your stories. You are people who can articulate the difference that faith makes in your lives. And regardless of age, I wrote down here, even in the most ancient of your ranks. The spirit continues to move and speak through you. God is not done with you yet. Wherever there is barrenness in your life, invite the spirit in, prophesy to the breath, and don't expect resurrection instantly. And be honest, you may not welcome it. Not right away. You may not be ready for it. But there will come a day, Lord knows when, when you will shake off the ashes, throw off the grave clothes, and begin again. Here's a, a funny story that happened this week. The Garden Club of Montclair, uh, the two falls that I have been here, uh, have donated uh, tulips. And the first year... Jean Blum and I went outside and on a gorgeous day and planted tulips around, and it was lovely. And they came up in the spring, and I did my little giddy dance because we get to be part of that. And we got more tulips this year, but it was cold, and the ground was hard, and I was less than ambitious to get out there and dig holes. So I, I bought some urns, and you'll see them by the doors. Uh, there's two over there, and there's two right over there. And I put the bulbs in, covered them with the dirt, put in the fertilizer, and, and put two in front of the garage of the manse and two up on the porch. And then I was told a little bit later that, uh, by, by Allison that, that Kurt had moved the two in front of the garage into, into the garage because he figured when it snowed, ha, 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 because we've hardly gotten any snow, that they would get you know, hit by the, by the snow plows. And I will confess to you that I was annoyed. Because I'm like, they're going to need water. They're in the, in the snow or whatever, you know, that's, I think that's important that they, that they get those. But was I ambitious enough to go over and get them out of the, the, the garage? No. And then Yvonne discovered them this week. And they're growing like eight inches tall. And she, I, I showed up uh, Wednesday morning, they were out front of the manse, and I'm like, oh, I had intended them for the doors, so I moved two over here, and you'll see they're, you know, they're growing wonderfully. And the two that I left outside are by this door, and one of them looks okay, and the other one looks meh. And I, and I just like, you know, the two that were in the tomb of that garage are doing wonderfully. And the two, with all my machinations of how, you know, I know what to do and how to do this right, mm, they're, those are the ones that, you know, are, are struggling. I think there's a lesson in there. 
By our own efforts, we can plan and manipulate and strategize and cajole, and without the Spirit, we come to nothing. We can't control the Spirit, but we can recognize when the Spirit shows up, and we can praise God. And the Spirit will, in us and through us. It should be noted in this passage that the raising of Lazarus was the nail in the coffin for Jesus. Because the religious authorities thought, you know, he just healed a blind man, he just raised somebody from the dead, more and more people are going to believe in him and see him as the Messiah, and the Romans are going to be threatened by that, and they're going to smack down hard on us, and better to sacrifice one man than all of us get decimated. Next week is Palm Sunday, and the journey into Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter. The journey goes down before we go up. There's a life lesson. It's always down before we go up. Psalm 139, but where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol is the pit. Sheol is that dark place where there is no light that even on tippy toes you cannot see God or hope. God is there too. If I take the wings of morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. And the beginning of John is the light came into the world and darkness did not overcome. May the Spirit breathe new life in whatever hard thing you are facing, and I know that we are all facing hard things. When it's time, when you're ready, when you're more than ready, you will see the sun and be filled with hope, and you will rest assured that you worship the living God. If it were not so, the church would have died out a long time ago. We are the descendants of generations upon generations upon generations upon generations who have witnessed in their lives the living God. May it be so. It will always be so. In Jesus' name, amen.